I always feel like a distance from what I write. I mean, what I write is not necessarily who I am. I own it, I wrote it, yes, I said that. But do I like live with it every second of the day? No, there's a little bit of detachment. I mean, I think that's part of the professionalism, right? Um, I can't live or die, because I got something else to write tomorrow. Newspaper columnist, award-winning playwright, and novelist Lee Cataluna, next on Long Story Short. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox is Hawaii's first weekly television program produced and broadcast in high definition. Aloha mai kako, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Lee Cataluna has earned a reputation for a keen understanding of local people and local culture. And yet she'll tell you she's always been an outsider. And indeed, her newspaper columns have made her a lightning rod, attracting a lot of attention and prompting heated debates at water coolers around the state. She has many fans who believe she's able to go to the heart of a matter and say what no one else dares to say. Her work is hailed for its character studies and the humorous insights into the idiosyncrasies of our island community. Lee Cataluna's career has taken her from television reporter and anchor to playwright, newspaper columnist, and novelist. She's been awarded the Elliot Cades Award for Literature and the Po'okela Award for Playwriting. Her roots are in the neighbor islands and in the bygone days of Hawaii sugar industry. Her father, Donald Cataluna, was a third generation plantation worker and a manager with C. Brewer. About every three years, he relocated the family and they lived on various plantations on Maui, Kauai, and Hawaii Island. That means Lee was changing friends and changing schools along the way. I think I lost count. It was something like nine or, you know, my Facebook is all messed up because you get connected by people you went to school with, right? And so, like, I went to so many different elementary schools. But only one high school, only Baldwin High School. Yeah, so after Kauai, we moved back to Wailuku, and my dad was then manager at Wailuku Sugar, and we lived in the manager's house, which was just, you know, amazing. And when you're the manager of the plantation, you're the, <laughs> you're the mayor, right? I kind mean, you of. control what happens in a very large area of town. Kind of. I mean, there was that responsibility, um, you know, but, but Sugar was already struggling, right? I mean, that brings us up into the 80s. Um, so it wasn't quite as huge as, you know, generations past. My dad had two company cars and, <laughs> um, you know, the big house that is now... Did you feel rich? Uh, did I feel rich? Well, no, because, you know, the reality was that my mom was sewing my clothes and, you know, <laughs> like I didn't get to go to Liberty House and buy whatever I wanted kind of thing. What were your parents like as parents? They never spoke pigeon at home, not because I don't know if that was a choice. That was just, they just never did. Did you speak pigeon? At, were you allowed to speak pigeon at home? Yeah, I was allowed to, but I didn't. I mean, I'm sure there's the inflection, right? But in terms of like the heavy duty pigeon, that was saved for school. So when the boyfriends did arrive, what was your dad the like? The boyfriends did not arrive. They, <laughs> <laughs> oh, they, they, they met you outside. <laughs> they did not arrive. No, I'd meet them at the wherever. Because <laughs> you didn't want them to go through the, the gauntlet of your dad? Yeah, my dad was the full on like shotgun father. I think I was out of high school already when I brought a boy home and my dad actually like showed him his collection of bull whips. <laughs> so in yeah. a meaningful way. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I cracked them and everything. So I mean not the guy, although maybe I'm just remembering that wrong. <laughs> but yeah, it was it was a protected. And childhood. what about your mom? She was also strict. No, my mom is the, the Kool-Aid mom that um, you know, all the kids show up at her house. She just loves to feed kids, and she still does that. You know, like she'll buy popsicles, like those big Costco popsicle. Not for anybody that actually lives with her, but you know, <laughs> anybody who might drive by on a motorcycle or a bicycle. You know, so yeah, she was my mom's kind of nuts in a in a sweet way. <laughs> She's the kind of person who would make stew for the cat, you know, because <laughs> he <laughs> likes it. <laughs> Did you what what what? parts of your parents' personalities did you find yourself picking up? The bad parts. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, my dad's sort of obsessive nature. He doesn't forget a slight. Oh, um, But you know, the, the good side of that is, you know, he, he tends to um, be focused. And my dad is a good storyteller. So I think I, I hope I, I'm like that. Um, and my mom is very fanciful. I mean, she kind of sees the the silly in life. You know, like my parents joined the Koloa 
um, Visayan club, and they're not Filipino. <laughs> but my mom's like, it's okay, that's all my friends. And I'm like, but it's like you're trying to pass. She goes, nobody cares, you know. And <laughs> So they don't care what, she didn't care what anybody thought, she just wanted to do what she wanted to do. Because the parties were fun, you know, and there was all her friends, so she was going to join the Visayan Club, and there I am worried about, you know, procedure and that kind of stuff. She's like, nah, it's totally, yeah. it's cool. <laughs> Did you know you were going to be a, a, a writer, a storyteller from early on? No, but I had the experience uh, recently of um, going to Zippies with a bunch of people I went to high school with, and we're all talking about what we're doing Which now. Which Zippies did you go to? Uh, Kahului. We were okay. on Maui. So we're all there, and we're talking about, like, one of my friends is a high school teacher. She's like, could you ever picture me as a high school teacher? And um, one is a mail carrier. Could you ever picture me working for the post office? And it came to me, and I'm like, could you ever picture me doing this? And they're like, yes. Really? So, yeah. Why, so. why did they say that? I don't know. I guess... I guess because I was getting in trouble for writing stuff when I should have been doing math, those kind of things. It's interesting. I've heard you describe <laughs> yourself as bookish, earnest, kind of a dork. Oh, yeah. But I mean, I think the perception was, here's this very pretty social girl. And, no. Um, I, I, no? <laughs> no. 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 And dork not in a, like, um, hyper-intelligent way, but dork in a, like, clumsy, oddball way, like that. Were you perceived that way, too? I think so. No, I was, I was never on the homecoming court, you know, I was, and Baldwin had this great rule where once you served as a princess, like homecoming, basketball rally week, uh, May Day court, even if you were like Miss Princess Kaho'olawe, that was it. That was like your one shot for all of high school. So by the time you get to senior year, like most of the girls had had their, their time with the tiara. Nothing. Did you have to run for it? Is it an election or do you have to be picked for it? How did you get to be that? Um, election. Popular vote. Did you run? I think I self-nominated, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sad, yeah. But, uh, but, but that, that helps writers to, to, for them to consider themselves outsiders because you become a better observer, right? Yes. I think, I think writers tend to be that outsider-ish kind of character. And do you feel like an outsider? Always. Even though you're clearly plugged into local culture. No, I'm always the outsider. Yeah. <laughs> I'm much more comfortable sort of being in the back of the room watching everybody than being the one on stage. And your mom gave you advice about that too once, didn't she? About listening? Oh yeah, her thing was always, um, and she told me from when I was a little, little girl, keep your eyes and ears wide open and your mouth shut. <laughs> Lee Cataluna chose psychology and dance as her major fields of study at the University of the Pacific in Stockton, California, graduating with honors in 1988. She was planning to go on to graduate school until she was bitten by the broadcasting bug, hosting a talk show at a Kauai public access station. In 1991, she became a news director for a radio station and two years later started a 10-year chapter in local television as a news reporter and anchor. While still in broadcasting, Lee Cataluna's writing took on a new form when she wrote her first play, Damea, which broke box office records for Kumu Kahua Theater. She went on to write other productions for Kumu Kahua, as well as Diamond Head Theater and the Honolulu Theater for Youth. Audience favorites included Folks You Meet in Longs, Musubi Man, You Somebody, and Ulua the Musical. She started this turn in her life while on a trip for the local NBC TV affiliate station. The how I got into playwriting story was I was working at um, KHNL and they sent me to uh, New York to do the promos like sitting next to Matt Lauer and Katie Couric and hi watch me and hi watch me kind of thing. Um, and it was my first trip to New York City and it was my first time traveling alone other than going back and forth to college and I was scared. and. Um, felt lonely and sad and the promos at uh, NBC lasted like 20 minutes like it took 20 minutes they had me in how's it we did our thing out and then I had two more days in New York City by myself so after I stopped crying in the hotel lobby <laughs> I got my act together and said okay I'm here I might as well see stuff and I had to really force myself to see a Broadway play because I thought you know as a frustrated dancer I'm going to be sitting there going, I hate them, I hate them all, they're fabulous, I'm not fabulous, they're tall, I'm not tall, they're skinny, I mean, all that stuff. Um, they're great, I suck. And I was kind of racing for that, you know, internal monologue. <laughs> and instead, much to my shock, 
the voice in my head was saying, you know, you could write that. Wow. Which was weird. I'm sure most people don't go to plays and say that. I don't know. It was, I mean, it was fun. I went to see um, How to Succeed in Business Not Really Trying. So this is when you were a television anchor. Were you doing the morning or evening Mornings. news then? Mornings. And uh, so this is a totally new experience and the first time you really came up with the idea? Yeah. I had been in like two plays in my life and I'd certainly seen, you know, like community theater kind of plays. I'd never been to Kumukuhua. And you hadn't thought of writing no. a play? No. I had done sketches for radio, but you know, like a like minute, 30, three minute. Um, and then when I came home from that trip, in my mailbox was a flyer from Kumukuhua announcing their summer playwriting classes. And I'd never been to that theater before. And I thought, oh, this is the sign. Yeah. So I had to talk myself into going to class because I'm thinking, wow, well, everybody's going to be like these smart, UH grad students who can quote Shakespeare, and then there's me. Um, and I was right. That was the <laughs> class. And they could all quote Shakespeare, and then there was me. Um, but I loved that class. It was uh, Vicki Newell's class. And I took it like four summers in a row, something like that, five summers, yeah. Was it, was, it wasn't the same class, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it was. Totally, yeah. I took her class. I could not get enough of her class. <laughs> I just kept taking it over and over. Yeah, and, and I just it, loved it, just it, loved being what, near her. At what point did you have a play that was actually performed? Um, actually, after the first summer. Really? I wrote my first play that summer, and it was, um, I wrote it from an assignment. The whole, like, germ of the play was from an assignment from Vicki. And I wrote the first scene, and I liked it. And then the next week, I wrote another scene, and that went over pretty, pretty good, and um, just kept going. So at the end of six or eight weeks, I had a first draft. And I was fortunate that one of my classmates, um, John With White, was on the board at Kumukuhua. And so he took my play. And what was it? Which play was it? Damea, which, you know, I regret naming it that because it's a weird spelling, but it's, you know, Damea, so. Yeah. yeah. That was it, it was hooked, and, totally hooked. And how, did, how had you been perceiving your journalism career? Was that gonna be your <laughs> career, or was that a interim, or what, what, what was that to you? Um, I think I was kind of in the moment. I think, you know, I was working morning news, which I loved, but I found the hours just brutal. Right. Yeah. I got frustrated, you know. Um, and, I, you know, I regret the way I left. Um, but as it turned out, you know, I, I probably needed to do something different pretty soon. When you say um, the way you left, I don't know the way you abruptly. left. Abruptly. <laughs> oh, you just said, I'm done? Yeah. Yeah. yeah and did you know what you were going to do? No. No. Yeah, there was well, that's a, a step of faith or, or frustration or something. Stupidity. Yeah. You were unemployed for a while? I went to L.A. I was taking some classes. I was working on an indie movie that fell apart. Um, then I came home and I applied at the advertiser. They were advertising for uh, a reporter, a Maui-based reporter. And I'm like, I could totally live on Maui. I could totally be a reporter there. And I sent in my application letter. and almost immediately got back a, sorry, but we're looking for a real journalist, not like a TV. I mean, between the lines I read, right, a TV right. Twinkie, right? And I'm like, err. So I employed a technique that um, a dear friend of mine once told me about, and it was a brilliant move. I said, let me prove myself to you. You know, give me a tryout. I will work for two for free. weeks for free, and let me show you what I can do. Well because it was a union shop, they couldn't let me work for free, but I did get a two week tryout. And I just, <laughs> I did cartwheels. I turned in every assignment they gave me plus something else every single day of those two And you weeks. were a straight reporter. Straight reporter. Covering daily news. On Maui, yeah. Just, you know, the city council kind of, you know, county council on Maui. Um, and after those two weeks, uh, I met with the managing editor, and he said, "Well, you, you know, you're in as a reporter, but you, you can you can kind of write. Have you ever thought of being a columnist?" And here I am, like, I need me a job. So I said, "Columnist? I've totally always wanted to be a columnist." Well, why would he suggest that? You know what it was? There was a story I wrote about um, the Paia sugar mill, and um, I went and I talked to some people, and I there was you know just some some writerly things that happened there because that was a story I could totally relate to. You know, like standing there in the shower of ash coming out of the, the mill and, and um, you know, just the way that felt, you know, like this is today and it's not going to be tomorrow and that kind of thing. Um, yeah, so he said, have you ever 
thought of being a columnist, and I'm like, oh, I would totally love to be a columnist. So then I had a tryout period with that, and first thing, you know, was to go home and figure out what's a columnist. Mm -hmm. So I, I was, I'm, I'm rarely slick in my life, but I had a moment of slickness. I'm like, oh, a columnist. Well, who are some of your favorites? So I'm like, try to remember the name. Try to remember the name. <laughs> so I could go home and do some homework before I. And you started off being a columnist for the Maui beat only. No, uh, Metro. So Metro. I moved to. I was yeah. I came to came back to Honolulu. And uh, that was that. I went, so in the beginning, there was no um, thought that you would um, sort of be a translator and a voice for local culture. Actually, my job offer from Jim Gaddy, who was the editor at the time, um, is really like boldly written, worded. Um, he, he says, we want you to be provocative. You know, and he describes, we want you to provoke reaction. We want you to have um, people spit out their coffee at the breakfast table. Now, did that appeal to you? No. <laughs> I needed the job. We want you to. Uh, we want people to to take the paper and throw it on the ground. We want people to cut out what you wrote and keep it in their wallets. And I thought, wow! Like, how many times is a Portuguese Hawaiian woman asked to do something like that? You know. Mm -hmm. And by nature, it doesn't suit my nature. I'm just sort of not like that. You know. I I really do want to be the one in the back of the class, watching everything, taking copious notes, but not saying anything, and certainly not causing, not provoking. Yeah, but making comments to yourself. To right? myself, <laughs> maybe, or to the person sitting next to me, or just right. kind of rolling my eyes so nobody can see, like in the back. Um, but that was, that was a challenge, and I thought, wow, this is an opportunity, and I'm super lucky that it came to me, and I'll give it a shot. After the Honolulu Advertiser folded, Lee Cataluna's husband, Jim Kelly, lost his editorial post at the newspaper, and the family relocated to California so that her husband could accept a newspaper position in Palm Springs. At the time of this conversation in 2011, Lee's column for the Honolulu Star Advertiser is written an ocean away. It continues to spark public debate and discussion. I try to make sure that the person I take on is bigger than I am. You know, like that's the rule, right? You don't pick on anybody littler than you. Um, so I would never take on an individual. I would never take on anybody who doesn't have the same or more access to the media. Mm -hmm. You know, um, that's only fair. Um, and I, you know, I, I try not to make it personal. I mean, I don't know that I, I always do a good job at that, but I really try. In fact, there's some people you like, but you've you've criticized them. Oh yeah. Yeah, and and you know, turnabout is fair play. Yeah, so so you get criticized back. Yeah, that's oh, the job. <laughs> I would I would guess. I mean, you've written a lot of controversial columns that have provoked lots of um, blog <laughs> commentary. I would just hazard a guess that the most controversial ones, or the most reaction you had, was the one uh, where you wrote uh, when June Jones, after <laughs> having taken his team to the Sugar Bowl, quit the UH, and yeah. you said June. Don't, let, don't <laughs> yeah. let the door hit you on the pocketbook on the way out. Yeah. Goodbye. Yeah. I always feel like a distance from what I write. I mean, what I write is not necessarily who I am. I own it. I wrote it. Yes, I said that. But do I like live with it every second of the day? No. There's a little bit of detachment. I mean, I think that's part of the professionalism, right? Um, I can't live or die with because I got something else to write tomorrow. Um, do I feel that way about the man personally? No, um, but I think in the moment, like it was a good thing to write. It was a good column for that particular point of time. It made people think. Yeah, and it, and it made people react. I think a columnist has to be like the wall that people react off of, they bounce off of. Um, and there were things to be said about um, you know, this very highly paid, high profile, um, almost like idol in our community. Um, the who's making this football coach. Yeah, you know, so let's, so let's talk about it. And if, um, if I can, play a role in the discussion saying that she's right, she's wrong, this, that, or whatever, that, and I've done my job. Well, just recently, <laughs> as we speak in 2011, <laughs> there was the, gov uh, the governor and his wife, Nancy, decided to take their 30th year anniversary in Paris, something they had dreamed of. And here comes Lee saying, hey, come on, look at the economy. You should be having your anniversary at, where did you say, Maui Seaside Hotel? I think it's, yeah, <laughs> or Uncle Billy's or something. <laughs> I don't know. You know, again, do I, you know, do I do I feel like so emotionally tied to this that I would I don't know go hold a sign outside of their holiday? 
No, it's it's a function of, you know, here's an opinion. Maybe maybe people will talk about it. You know, maybe people will react to it. Maybe it'll provoke a discussion. Have you been surprised sometimes, Amy? Because I'm, I'm sure you can predict the way most columns will be received. Mm -hmm. Was there any really counterintuitive response that you've experienced? Larry Mayhow called me up once and told me, right on, sister, you get balls. <laughs> this um, came years after, and I, I tell this story kind of as a source of pride, sort of the only person who has ever come up to me finger in my face said, I don't like what you wrote, was Larry Mayhaw. And he's a big guy. He's a big guy. And he, he you know, he carries yes. the, the weight of his name, you know? And he, you know, full on, you know, finger and everything. I didn't like that. What did he like? What did he like? What didn't he like? What didn't he like? Something I wrote about Frank DeLima, his friend. And the one he did like was the one I wrote about June Jones. Oh, really? No, you wrote about <laughs> Frank, was it the ethnic humor Frank DeLima yeah. column? You, you, you well, went yeah, after yeah, Frank for doing ethnic humor. In the schools. In the schools, I yeah. see. Yeah, and you know, he and I have kind of been in the same place. We've been in schools together since then, and you know, he's cool. I love his work, you know, just, but I know what it's like to be, I don't want to be, I don't want to be, <laughs> you know, causing him any more grief from me, but you know, I know what it's like to be a Portuguese Hawaiian girl growing up in Hawaii and having to deal with all the things that I am purported to be, you know, as a Portuguese girl. What is the stereotype oh. when you're growing up? <laughs> Talk too much, yeah. Talk too much, but say nothing. And you got that? Constantly, yeah. Yeah, and you know, I had to fight to be in the college prep classes. So we've talked about the columns <laughs> that got you the most uh, heated responses. What were your favorites? Were those the ones that were your favorites? You know, I really love, I know it sounds weird, um, but I love writing story obituaries. You know, where you can spend time with a family and try to get the tone right you know, of someone's life, you know, and what that, what that meant um, to the family, to the community, that kind of For stuff. For example? You know, one story I wrote, it, it was a while after the woman's death, but um, a man called me up and um, his daughter's killer was being sentenced and he uh, was asked for the first time in this whole long process after the murder, he was asked to give a victim statement and he wanted to kind of talk with me about it. Um, and I said, well, you know, I can't help you write it, but I can, you know, I'd love to hear your story. And we spent hours at his picnic table outside his house in Kalihi. And his wife kept bringing out food and journalists not supposed to eat, right? But in Hawaii, you, you have to. If so you turn had, it down. You know, uh, no. Yeah, that kind of the interview stops. And I think I had about three lunches and was moving on into dinner. <laughs> and I was still there talking to him. He spoke in metaphor in a like uniquely Hawaiian way. And I, I had to try to understand what he was saying. Like his daughter um, played the harp. And I thought, wow, that's an unusual instrument for a girl who grew up in Kalihi. What's that about? And he goes, well, you know, I was a diver and sounded like when I'm diving. So, so those kind of things, like I had to kind of understand him. And then um, I wrote his story about what it was like, uh, what her life meant to him, what it was like for him to try to give a victim impact statement in court. Um, and that was the first time I remember writing a story about someone's life and kind of feeling like um, I could almost hear them. You know, like I, I was, as I was writing it, I don't want to sound too like, ooh, kind of thing, but I was thinking, gosh, I hope I'm helping. You know, I hope I'm doing the right thing. I hope I'm getting this right. And I kind of felt a presence. Did they enter the column in the court record? Um, I think he might have read it, yeah. I, I don't know for sure, but I think he might have read parts of it and you know, had his own So that actually has given you the most satisfaction, that kind of column? Um, yeah, to, to try and, I, I like when I write about somebody, um, somebody alive <laughs> too, and they say, yeah, you know, you got it, you got you it right. It. In 2011, the year of this taping, Lee Cataluna published her first novel, Three Years on Doreen's Sofa, the story of a character named Bobby and his misguided attempts to go straight after serving prison time. Lee also is completing her studies in the Master of Fine Arts Creative Writing Program at the University of California at Riverside. 
Mahalo Piha, Lee Cataluna, for sharing your long story short. And thank you for watching and supporting PBS Hawaii. I'm Leslie Wilcox. Ahui ho kako. For audio and written transcripts of this program and all episodes of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, visit pbshawaii.org. If I'm not mistaken, some of your earliest storytelling had to do with comedy. You were doing audio, <laughs> right? Audio tapes. I did that for a while. And that's that's a real, I mean, I would think that's, to me, a co comedy is harder than anything. And, it, and yeah. it's such, it makes you so vulnerable. That's why I'm not doing it anymore. <laughs> um, Michael W. Perry told me to my face, you know, Lee, you're not funny. So, <laughs> And I think he was right. I'm not, I'm not funny in person. Um, sometimes I can write funny, but that was more like I did it when I was younger. Um, it wasn't what I wanted to be. Um, it's just sort of an experiment, you know. Grew up huge, huge fan of Booga Booga and rap and Andy Bumatai and Frank D. Lima and, um, you know, so much of my writing is influenced by, especially by rap, I would say. I mean, most people, my generation say that, right?